a gift to you for the joy of giving to you. I desire to, um, I desire for you to be happy. I would like you to be fulfilled. I have no expectations. I have no agendas about it, except that I would like to reduce your uh, strife and striving in the world. Welcome high performing entrepreneurs and business owners. Do you suffer from shiny object syndrome? Do you often feel scattered and distracted, making it hard to implement your plan with all the ideas and strategies coming at you? Do you often wonder if you have the right goals and plan? Welcome to Extraordinary Focus with David Wood, where we help you achieve way more in less time. Get the laser focus you need so you can double your business, double your impact in the world, and be an even more extraordinary entrepreneur and human. Let's dive in and stay tuned at the end for your gift. Welcome back to another episode. And this one is particularly exciting for me because this is a colleague and friend. Uh, and also I've been interviewing leaders, uh, but now because I'm so interested in the entertainment industry, now that I'm here in Hollywood, I'm interviewing leaders in the entertainment industry. And this man definitely qualifies. Barnett Bain is a Canadian filmmaker, author, and educator. Some of his film credits include Milton's Secret, uh, the Oscar winner, What Dreams May Come, one of my favorite movies. And I just did a scene from that in class. It was very, very difficult. Um, Emmy Award nominee, Homeless to Harvard, and The Celestine Prophecy, which I did not know that you were involved in that. We're going to have to talk about that. Barnett consults and trains business leaders and private clients who are committed to high performance. Through his creativity workshops, Barnett guides people of all ages and walks of life to expand their vision of what is possible and develop their gifts and talents with passion. Barnett Bain, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here with you, David. Good to see you. You too. You too. I haven't seen you since we had lunch at, uh, hey. in Malibu. Yeah. Is there anything, um, I just read a little bit about you. Is there anything that comes to mind that you would like listeners to know about you that I didn't say? Well, I can't think of anything that I would add to that. There's a whole life there that uh, is unsaid. So. Yeah. Yeah. I did like reading in your bio that you're a faculty member at Columbia uh, the Spirituality Mind Body Institute and the Esalen Institute. Do you know Susan Campbell? No, sorry, I don't know her. I don't know her. She wrote a book called Getting Real, and uh, she's been involved in Esalen for probably like 60 years or something. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe you would have, would have known her. Um, let's talk about, I guess there's, there's so much. Let's start with, truth. Since I'm a big fan of speaking edgy truth, and this is called Tough Conversations, you, I would consider a leader in, in Hollywood and the entertainment industry. What are some moments where you've had to say something difficult to someone that, that was edgy and other people might have stayed quiet, but you spoke up, either made a bold request, or you said no to something or you uh, had to share something with someone and give them maybe some feedback that they probably didn't want to hear. I'm interested in your success in spite of integrity or because of integrity. A really interesting question. Really interesting. Thank you for asking it. So I have found that um, the difficult conversations are internal. And that very often I can point to places uh, in the past and present as well, where um, my own unexamined um, um, fixed ideas about things, where I am uh, protecting a point of view, uh, those, that's what principally gets in the way of um, operating smoothly in the world and uh, working in collaboration with others. It's really um, um, 
having a sense of what my own fixed positions are and what I might be protecting. For example, I can remember a time uh, making a film and uh, I felt, um, I felt I didn't really know, uh, I didn't feel confident. I didn't really know uh, how to meet a particular situation. And so I remember hearing input from crew members and being um, and being brusque about it and cutting it off as really as a way I, I, I realized this is a way to um, pretend authority, to bluff authority, mm. and uh, <laughs> what would be what 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 is much more impactful is to uh, to be authentic and and truly vulnerable and recognize that I felt overwhelmed and um, that I welcomed some input on that. And so the uh, difficult conversations are almost always internal. And then creating a boundary, um, setting a limit outside, that is not difficult at all. It's, uh, I, I can't recall those conversations as being difficult. You you have conversations as authentically and vulnerably as one can and with um, uh, a sense of where you're really coming from. And you do it as graciously as possible. It's not always difficult. What is difficult is um, why we make it difficult. I like, I resonate with what you said about the the blustering is the word that comes to mind, where you like trying to control and show that you know everything. And then you realize that you are overwhelmed. Were you able to say that and say, you know, I'm actually overwhelmed and that's why I haven't been taking input and tell me what you got. Was that a transparent moment? You know, it's sometimes, sometimes I am more uh, successful. There is a kind of um, velocity of integrity, I call it. There is a speed of integrity. How quickly <laughs> can I integrate? How quickly can I assemble the fragmented parts of myself <laughs> are inauthentic or triggered or responsive or reactive? Uh, how quickly can I identify, recognize, acknowledge that, forgive it, and pull it back? And sometimes... It's uh, sometimes it's appropriate to um, speak it, and but more often than not, it's not necessary to to announce it. It's just um, it's critical to move through it and to integrate and be uh, real and authentic and come from the core place and communicate from there. And then the conversations are not generally difficult. Sometimes they're uncomfortable. You don't want to consciously um, wound anybody or hurt somebody. Um, and as long as that's not the intention, doesn't necessarily make it all warm and fuzzy. But as long as that's not one's intention, you can, really can't ask um, of anyone or of yourself to do better than that. I like two points in there. Uh, firstly, the velocity of integrity. Love that. I, I, I like to say sometimes I am eventually very honest. And yeah, you're not going to spot it all. Some things you might spot 10 years later, and then you have a chance to go back and clean it up. Um, when I did the Landmark Forum, they said, look, these forum leaders, we we have rackets, we 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 have stuff all the time. We're just getting faster at it, faster at seeing it and then uh, speaking it. And then the second point you raised is sometimes you don't need to say it to the other person. You may realize, oh, I'm just not taking input here. I'm I'm blustering, I'm doing this. You're the only one who actually needs to see it. And then uh, you can just change your behavior. I say, you know what? Realize I haven't been listening. What do you got? 
And the change of behavior is everything. People, they attune to it. Once you change the behavior and you're coming from an authentic place, um, people can uh, sense the energy of that. Hmm. They don't require the announcement. They hmm. um, can hear things that are not always comfortable, but they can hear it is coming from uh, an honest place, not a dominating place, not a brusque place. You know, in our culture, particularly among leaders, there is a, um, it is fashionable to have rough edges and sharp elbows. It's very fashionable. It's certainly fashionable in the entertainment industry. It's fashionable in the tech industry. I, and I suspect it's fashionable everywhere uh, as we get, we move up the hierarchy or the hierarchy of control. If we get into C-suites and things, people have sharp elbows and they pride themselves on it. Hmm. That's unfortunate. Hmm. Wow, hey, there's so much going through my mind. I, as a teacher, one of the, the gurus that I, I would go and sit with, he said he used to knock knock the door down. That was his way. And then he said, <clears throat> as he's gotten older, he tends to uh, gently caress the door and see if someone wants to open it. And and even then, I still saw him jump on a few people, and I was one of them. But with Byron Katie, uh, who lives quite close to you and me, yeah. I, have, I have never seen her jump on anything anyone i know it's happened i heard once it happened but i've never seen a rough edge at all it's just pure love and i aspire to that mm -hmm. beautiful yeah that's who i want to follow um it's like that rough edge thing yeah it's interesting i do like it when i see someone who doesn't pull their punches and they speak very straight uh one of the teachers here where i'm training at the beverly hills playhouse is known for like boom but it doesn't seem unkind. There's no unkindness in it. I think he's coming from a good place. He just, here's my opinion, here's my opinion, here's my opinion. Well, you know, the thing about um, directing, right? Uh, and I'm also a director. And a, a director is, um, it's not always about having a conversation. So you're, Right. Be open to input. That doesn't mean that um, you're going to activate or actualize all input. You want to be open to input. And you also want to reserve the right not to have to respond to that input because right. um, time is the essence. And, you know, uh, as a director, you're operating with considerations that are not um, available to everybody. Not everybody knows what your considerations are. Right. Nobody knows what the subtext of a scene is. Mm -hmm. Only the director knows what the subtext of a scene is and um, shares it or doesn't share it uh, with whomever he or she pleases. The actor, of course, the director and the actor are on the same page vis-a-vis -vis the subtext but it is the director who brings to the words the subtext and that's true not only in the theater or in film but it's true in leadership it's mm. true in the way organizations are run it's true in the way teams or co corporations are run it's true in everything it's true in parenting it's true in parenting so you can, you know, we all share a language. To use the um, the simile of, of theater. We have plays, we have the canon of Shakespeare, and yet they're done millions of times every year across the, uh, across the planet. And each time you do Hamlet, for instance, the words are the same, but every performance is different. Why? They're all different because the subtext is different in every single one. If I read on a page and it says, um, you know, um, David comes in and says, hello. If you're a um, CEO or a parent or a film director, you decide, is that hello like get out of my face? 
Is that hello like I truly welcome uh, seeing you? Is it hello like I want to seduce you? Is it hello like I'm a bill collector? Is it hello? What are the, where is the coming? Where is the come from? And we want to become um, close and tender. We want to become intimate with where we're coming from always mm. in every interaction. And it's not a simple thing to do. Know it's not your, a simple thing to be. Know yourself. Um, you know, as you were speaking about directing, I started thinking about parenting and executives and leadership. And um, I'm reminded of a West Wing scene where the actor playing Matt Santos's character, I forget his name, Jimmy, someone from Law and Order, is speaking to Alan Alda. And uh, Alan Alda says, well, what if I don't agree with you? And he said, I'll give you all the time you need to turn me around. But at the end of the day, I'll make the call and I'll expect you to get on board as if it was your decision. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that. Same with parenting. It's like, okay, we're going to talk about it for a fixed period of time. But at the end of the day, I, I may make the call and you may not agree with it. And I need you to be on board with it and back it. That sounds like a good leadership model to me. I think so. You know, there are some, um, there are some guidelines and it include parenting guidelines. And uh, that is one of them. Um, one of them is, I love you, and sometimes I'm going to, um, I'm going to tell you, yeah, or instruct you in ways that you may or may not appreciate. But it's my prerogative as a parent, and um, and at some point that it, that relationship ends. Along with that, there are other messages that, you know, I see you, I hear you, you matter to me, you're important to me. I give you permission to be different than me and not lose my love. Important uh, for a parent to model that to a child. And equally, it's important for a leader to model that to a team. I give you permission to be different than me. You don't have to share my beliefs, my politics, my values across the board. Um, in some instances, we need to have alignment for what we are co-creating together. But I give you permission to be different than me and not lose my respect. Oh, I love that. I'm writing that down and not lose my respect. I wonder if this is a good segue into a book, which I believe you're writing. And I wonder, can we tell people the title or is the title title hush -hush. title is a little I'm, I'm still not 100 settled on it so let's hold off on it but it is a book about friendship yeah one thing that stood out to me when you told me about the book was it it seemed to be about um being a friend and not in order to get anything it was there are books about giving so that you end up receiving a lot more. There are books giving in order to uh, do a favor for someone first. And then there's a law of reciprocity. You seem to have a, have a very different take on friendship. And I wonder if you'd talk about that. Well, giving in order to is not giving. It's a manipulation. It's a transaction. That it's, it's, that's called agency as opposed to self-agency. That's the same thing as if I go out to my agent and I say, I need you to find me um, um, uh, um, a financier or a part or an actor. And in return, they get 10%. That's an agent. Um, and, and very often in our culture, we are conditioned by the inputs all around us and by the modeling all around us. We are conditioned to confuse agency, not self-agency, agency, transactional agency for love, you know, and 
we see it everywhere. I, I love you, I love you, I love you. But what really is going on is I'm doing this for you and now I have expectations. I expect you uh, to be a good child. I expect you to be a good spouse, a good partner, a good friend, because look what I do for you. I did this, I did this, I did this, and now you owe me. I have a ledger going. Right, right. So that is uh, transactional. Um, there is a different kind of friendship. There's a different kind of relationship where I uh, give to you for the, because it, for the joy of giving to you. I desire to, um, I desire for you to be happy. I would like to reduce your um, suffering in the world. I would like you to be fulfilled. I have no expectations. I have no agendas about it, except that I would like to reduce your your uh, strife and striving in the world. Just, I want that for you. That is not transactional. And it, um, it makes for um, a satisfying, a very satisfying um, component bond of friendship. Is it possible that it's an evolution to get to that place? And I'm wondering if, if people are coming from scarcity and feeling like they're having trouble feeding themselves and, you know, that's one thing. And then if you get to say a Byron Katie stage or an Eckhart Tolle or, or, or someone like that, you evolve to a place where it's like, you know, giving for the joy of it is the ultimate thing. Or do you think no matter where you are in the world uh, in, or in your evolution, you can benefit from, from this model? You know, that's such a good question. I don't have a simple answer for that, for, even for myself. Because I have, a, I have seen um, people in very, very dire circumstances, substance mm -hmm. living, who are uh, so generous of spirit. And I've also seen people who I, I know, billionaires, who... Um, are transactional in every in every interaction, and really, it is in the nature of our society to be transactional. It um, it is increasingly modeled in our um, in our media, in our uh, drama. Just like conflict is increasingly modeled in our media and in our drama, and very rarely uh, do the pleasures of, of uh, non-transactional relationships, where we very rarely see them anywhere. We have to go out into nature to have an experience of that. Uh, nature is not transactional. And uh, these trees outside my um, office here are... Uh, not, um, they don't have agendas. They don't withhold shade unless they, they're, they're not, they're not modeling that kind of um, community, all the trees and nature outside the window. So we don't have, a, we increasingly um, are exposed to uh, conditioned relationships. You owe me, I get this, indebtedness. Um, our social media is, you know, is competitive and, sh and, and shows indebtedness and um, our um, influencers, you know, our influencers are trying to change us uh, uh, for their own for their, their own aggrandizement or enrichment. So there is, everybody has a dog in the race, dog in the hunt. And we rarely see um, 
and getting more and more rare. Do we see um, people who are in it for the pleasures of, of being involved? You said it's model, it's not, the transactional nature is modeled in the uh, in entertainment and social media. Are you changing that with the projects that you get involved in and the what you create? You're looking, is that one of the reasons you've been involved in some transformational media? When I was a young man, I uh, would have said, I would have agreed with that. Um, I don't know that it was true. It, it, actually, I do know. It wouldn't have been true. Um, but I would have deluded myself into saying that. I, I don't at this point have a desire. Reframe. I, I don't. It, it's not my focus to change the world. That's a transaction. So I'm not out to change the world. I um, I wish for others um, well-being. I uh, I wish them to have good lives. And I don't know what that means. I'm not going to presume to know what that means for other people. Uh, I wish for them to have as um, graceful um, a life path along their path as possible, but I can't know another person's path. So I um, increasingly work on projects that are fun and that turn me on. And also because um, I make a living at it, there is that transactional component. I, I want it to generate resources. So there, there's complexity in all of these ideas. What makes it a little clearer to me is that uh, I don't have the same, my ego is not quite as large as it used to be. I have hats here and they are smaller in hat size than they, <laughs> than they used to be. My head had gotten a little smaller, not much, but a little smaller. <laughs> well, before I let you go, what are you working on now that's fun for you? You know, it's all fun. This conversation is super fun. It's all fun. You know, I'm working on um, some books. I'm working on a garden. I'm working on uh, writing a few things. And it's all, it's all fun. Awesome. Well, I've enjoyed this. Thank you very much. I've, I've got some notes here. I got a couple of quotes here that I really love. I particularly love velocity of integrity. Is That's new to me. Um, where can people find out more about you if they want to track you down and follow your work or engage with you in, in some way? Um, LinkedIn or online social media or um, barnettbain.com. And I'm going to spell that for, for spell that for listeners. Barnett Bain is B-A-R-N-E-T. Barnett Bain, B-A-I-N dot com. Uh, he's got a very cool website, and there's a photo of you with a cigarette hanging out of your mouth uh, at about age 20 and a half, I'm going to say, on that on that website. 18 years old. 18. I nearly went 19 and a half. You were close. Yeah. <laughs> All right, mate. Barnett Bain, thanks for being on the show. Hey, thank you so much. Appreciate uh, you having me. You've been listening to Extraordinary Focus with David Wood. Now to achieve way more in less time, to double your business and your impact in the world, and to be an even more extraordinary entrepreneur and human, make sure you get your gift basket. It includes a cheat sheet to double your focus, a short video to implement the steps and a free focus audit to identify the number one focus leak in your business and how to plug it. To get all three of these goodies, just go to myfocusgift.com. If you've gotten value out of this episode, tell your friends. And nothing says keep up the good work, David, like a review, which helps us climb in the rankings and reach more listeners. Now, let's be extraordinary.